Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started with the uh, proceedings here. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much for braving the wintry weather to be with us here. Um, I'm uh, Nazneen Barma. I'm the director of the Scrivener Institute of Public Policy and associate professor here at the Corbell School at the University of Denver. Um, I'd, like, I'd just like to um, start with an uh, acknowledgement that the University of Denver campus sits on the ancestral homeland of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people who have stewarded this land uh, for generations and whose loss we recognize and mourn. We offer continued respect and support to them and to all the indigenous tribes and nations who call Colorado and the Rocky Mountain West home. We commit to listening and affirming uh, to all of the stories in our community. Um, and that's indeed what we're uh, here to, to do today, to, to, to have a conversation uh, about uh, stories from our community, about policy um, in, uh, in, in our community. Um, we're so pleased uh, to be here with you all again in person for the second uh, Scrivener Policy Roundtable with the Bell Policy Center presenting uh, and representatives from our other roundtable partners here. It's great to see friends again from Common Sense Institute, uh, Colorado Action Lab, and, and many other groups. Uh, forgive me for not uh, naming uh, all of the in institutions, but we're delighted to have you all here. Um, we're delighted to see our, uh, some of our MPP students here, along with staff and faculty from across the university uh, working on public policy issues. A uh, special thank you to Doug Scrivener, uh, who's here with us today and whose gift with Mary Scrivener makes all of this possible. And uh, good morning to Fritz Mayer, Dean of the Corbell School. Thanks for uh, your support, Fritz. One of the uh, core mandates of the Scrivener Institute um, is to serve as an interdisciplinary hub uh, for conversations on policy, both on the DU campus and uh, with the local community. And as part of that work, I think I, I mentioned last time, but I'd just like to reiterate because things have moved forward with this, um, the Scrivener Institute is playing a central role uh, on um, um, a major university-wide initiative on civil discourse along with the Corbell School and uh, other partners. The ultimate goal of that uh, initiative is an ambitious one. Uh, it's to renew our society's ability to engage in intelligent disagreements and productive dialogue between people who hold uh, differing and even opposing views on the collective policy challenges we face. This roundtable embodies those objectives uh, by foregrounding local policy issues um, with an emphasis in particular on informed and evidenced dialogue among community partners who work on public policy. We had that last time with Common Sense Institute, and I know we're going to get that today with our uh, presenters from the Bell Policy Center. We're really delighted to continue building this network uh, and collaborative research and learning environment among the many of us working uh, in this community on local policy issues. I just want to uh, give a quick reminder of the format today and uh, some rules of the road. We're going to record the presentation portion of this, uh, pres uh, the presentation portion of the event, uh, which we will then have available uh, on uh, the Corbell School's YouTube channel, and hopefully the Bell uh, Policy Center will feature it as well. We think that'll take no, no more than 30 minutes or so. Um, and then a consistent piece of feedback uh, from our first event, and thank you all for responding to the, to the survey that we sent out, was that people wanted more discussion across the board. So we thought we would follow the presentation uh, with about 15 minutes or so of small group discussion at your table so that uh, everybody can have a, a conversation uh, with your table mates. And then I'll moderate a 30 minute or so uh, Q&A and a plenary discussion to round things out. The conversations, both small group and plenary, will be conducted under closed door rules where participants are free to use uh, the information received uh, during the conversation, but comments are not for attribution to speakers or to the institutions they represent. And those guidelines are really intended to help facilitate uh, robust and respectful dialogue, again, conducted on the basis of evidence with our shared goal uh, of all of us here of developing constructive solutions to hard problems. Thanks so much to Katie Aker, the program manager of the Scrivener Institute, uh, who is instrumental in implementing uh, this roundtable concept and all of our other Corbell colleagues who are here helping us out. An enormous thank you to our presenters today, uh, Andrea Kuwick, and I'm sorry, Andrea, I didn't ask you how to pronounce it. Good. <laughs> Senior policy analyst at the Bell Policy Center and Shannon Seacrest, uh, deputy director of the Cross Colorado Disability Coalition, who will be presenting Bell's fascinating work on the state of aging in Colorado. Before they get going with their presentation, I will hand it over to Scott Wasserman, president of the Bell Center, uh, Bell Policy Center, and also incidentally, or perhaps not incidentally, uh, soon to be professor uh, here of our policy lab and the MPP program next quarter, along with Ian Silveri. Um, Scott, let me just add, as I hand this over to you, that we're so grateful uh, to the Bell for being a roundtable partner. Um, well, uh, first of all, Naz, thank you so much, uh, and, and uh, Fritz and the Scrivener Center really appreciate the opportunity uh, to share a little bit of the kind of work that we do at the Bell Policy Center. 
Um, and I should say, this is like the first time I'm speaking to a live audience since the beginning of the pandemic. And one of the, one of the meetings I had right before the curtain went down was, was with Fritz just talking about what this center uh, would become and what the idea was. And I, I thought it was great because I, I think, um, yes, like there are so many policy organizations in our community uh, and oftentimes we're not talking in a room uh, with each other where we can see each other's humanity, where we can have honest dialogue. We're talking over that wonderful uh, uh, forum for public discussion uh, known as Twitter. And that that is not a great place to talk about these ideas, right? Um, policy does not uh, work well in 240 characters. Um, so just, just real quick, and I'll keep my remarks very, very short because I want you to hear from the people who've actually done the work today. Um, but just a little bit about the Bell Policy Center. You know, we were founded in 2000, so we've been around for 22 years, we just celebrated uh, our, our 20th. Um, and, um, you know, when we were founded, the whole idea was that we were an organization that was focused on doing policy analysis and research and advocacy around the issue of economic mobility. And one of the most um, important reports uh, that, that the Bell put out in the early years was an understanding of how economic opportunity mechanically worked. And, you know, what they did put together was a, uh, a paper that talked about, I think it was 10 or 13, 13, 13 rings to my mind, but 13 gateways uh, to economic opportunity. And, you know, it's interesting because you think about, you know, just the idea of analyzing economic opportunity and thinking about the stops along the way that we see as critical to achieving uh, good economic uh, outcomes. And so we started out looking, you know, look at, you have to be born at a healthy birth weight, right? If that's, that's going to be a great catalyst for your trajectory. And then we went on. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of that was retiring with a, a financially secure retirement and, and ending your days comfortably, right? Um, and then, of course, there were other stops along the way. And some of those um, gateways have now become commonplace in our public discourse. Um, you know, literacy by third grade. We didn't invent that concept, uh, but that was definitely one of the gateways that we identified. Today in the public policy conversation, that's just commonplace. And in fact, there's a whole body of law that, that sees that as a critical metric. Uh, and we actually organize our policies around that. Um, and, you know, I think, I think for, for me, thinking about the issue of aging, it's kind of, in some ways, the most important gateway because it really is a lag indicator of what we have done on the way, right? And if we achieve those other milestones. Um, and so I think really the study of aging is a study of outcomes. Um, and I think personally that it's, it's, it, it says something about the advocacy and the, the efficacy of the policy space, right? The, many of the data points that Andrea and, and Shannon are gonna talk about today are the data points that we look at throughout. So, you know, we, you look at our, our report and you see, you know, financial, you know, financial solvency and financial health and health outcomes and inequality indicators, right? Well, those are all of the things that we talk about and debate through the course of a person's entire life. But I was trying to find a, a, a less crude term for this, but really aging is where the chickens, you know, come home to roost, right? And we really do get to see what, um, what the outcomes of our policies and our socioeconomic uh, economy are, right? Um, and so, you know, I think, and I guess the thing that strikes me, and it was maybe a, a few months ago, I was reading an article about, um, you know, the, the brain drain that many people predicted in the policy environment is finally starting to materialize in all kinds of areas of the economy. And I thought to myself, man, have I read, I've read maybe like three or four papers over the years and written papers that talked about the coming, you know, the coming crisis. What are we going to do in terms of training and workforce development? And I thought to myself, maybe we, we shouldn't have ignored those papers. You know, I don't, I don't know if policymakers set out to ignore the work that we do as policy organizations. But I think that um, part of our job is to make sure that we, that we don't just write great white papers, put them on the website, and then hope and pray that policymakers will read them and take them seriously. Like, part of our job as policy organizations is to make this information compelling and to be a part of the conversation. Because when we ignore policy issues like brain drain, or we ignore policy issues like the gig economy and what is going to happen to the workforce, we find ourselves reacting and not being proactive and not being prepared. And I can think of so many debates that are going on today in which we have been talking about this as a collective space. We may not always agree, but we can all agree that the changing workforce is a problem. We can all agree that healthy retirement savings is a problem. Let's not wait until the storm arrives, right? And so I think what's really challenging is that as we look at the area of aging, 
I think it's an opportunity for us to look back and say, did we know about these factors before they materialized in our current look at Colorado's aging population? And why didn't we address these issues? And I'm not suggesting that all of those issues could have been solved or that we could have uh, you know, addressed the gaps between us. But I think that this area in particular is not only important because these people matter, because they are us. If there's anything that unites us and humanizes us, that we all get old, right? And the state of Colorado, you know, I mean, how many demographer reports have predicted, we have known for quite some time how young of a state Colorado was in the 70s and 80s, and that inevitably we would become a very old state, right? And so I think that part, I, I think we do this work because A, um, our aging population is a vital part of our population, right? And um, we need to talk about what we can do to make people's lives better. Um, and I think we also, you know, we're very committed to the idea of two generation, three generation policy to discount an entire population from our solutions, right, is, is madness, right? And in so many other countries, our, the aging population is a part of society and the economy and part of um, economic prosperity, right? And so I think that's one reason we do this work. And then I think finally, um, I think it's an excellent mirror to hold up and ask ourselves if we are create and how do we make sure that in the case where there are negative outcomes, how do we make sure we don't repeat those, right? In the case that there were positive outcomes, how do we replicate that? And, um, you know, and furthermore, how do we prepare? And I'll just leave, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave with that thought. You know, we do a lot of work on fiscal policy and oftentimes in the political chatter, it's like, well, the state has enough money. Well, enough money for what? Because I think what the, the conclusion that we find here is that many of our communities are unprepared. They need to change transit options. They need to change workforce training uh, and other kinds of infrastructure. They need to think about the direct care workforce, right? And so I think it's not just planning for today, it's preparing for tomorrow. And I think that's so much of what the work that Andrea uh, and Shannon have done and they're gonna talk to you about today. Just super quickly, I just really wanna thank Beyond the Next 50 Foundation, which has been uh, an amazing partner and funder of this work. I also just wanna um, you know, just, just recognize some of the policy partners. Um, you know, One Colorado, Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, Center for African American Health, CLARO, Tri-County Health Department, um, we really believe in community-engaged research uh, at the Bell Policy Center. We can't just sit in an ivory tower and, you know, analyze stats and data. So, so much of what Andrea has done, and I just really want to thank you, Andrea, for the work that you've done, is actually engaging people in community, finding out the anecdotal experiences, and then trying to correlate them to replicable uh, analytical data. And so I hope that's what you're going to uh, hear a little bit about today. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity, and we look forward to more of these kinds of discussions. So thank you. Well, well, well hopefully you all can hear me. Ah. Lovely. <laughs> uh, so thank you all. Um, again, my name is Andrea Kuick. I'm a senior policy analyst for the Bell uh, and joined again with Shannon from uh, the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. And so again, we're going to be talking here about the State of Aging Report, which we put out uh, a couple months ago here. And so just to walk you through a little bit about what we're going to be talking about kind of the, for the next 25, 30 minutes or so. Um, gonna gonna be kind of you know I think we hear a lot around you know why we created this report you know lots of questions around that so did want to spend just a little bit of time on that then talking a bit about how we created the report and then finally going into a lot of the findings that we have uh, then I'll hand it over to Shannon uh, to talk about some of her experience um, with the uh, report and then just thinking about kind of what aging looks like. Uh, from the work that she's doing. So just so you know, for the next 25 or 30 minutes, that's what we're going to be uh, walking through. So, ah, okay, here we go. So, you know, the first thing, and I think Scott really kind of touched on, on some of this, um, but, you know, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about why it is that we pay attention to aging in Colorado. You know, and I think one of the, because we, we do get a lot of questions around that, and I think that one of the first things to really pay attention to, you know, is that yes, we are a very young state, but whenever we look at it, you know, Colorado is, is aging really fast. Uh, we are 
now the second fastest aging state in the country. That's up from the third fastest aging state in the country. Uh, and I think, I think it probably would have been helpful if we would have had the, the pieces on the bottom to show exactly what we were showing with this. So I'm gonna walk you through that here in just a second. But this graph that you see up on uh, the screen here, this shows the change in our, in our demographics from 2020 to 2050. Uh, and so those two bars that you see on the very left, that's zero to 20, our change in population over the next 30 years, and then 21 to 64. The next one after that, that third bar on the left, that shows you our change in population for those who are 65 and older over that next 30 year period. And then it goes, it, the next bars after that, they break down the change in our demographics in kind of 10 year increments for those who are sent 65 to 74, and then again, 10 year increments after that. And so I think what you can really see from this is that when we look at our changing population in Colorado, we are getting older. And if we look at that, you know, our oldest segment of our population is changing much faster. And I think that then the logical question from that is, okay, great, our population is changing. Why does that matter? And, you know, I think from our perspective, what we really see is that it impacts the systems and it impacts the supports that we need for, for our changing communities. You know, so much of what I think our communities were built for was really for a younger population, right? And so we don't really take into account or to consideration, you know, what this means when our population is older. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we really pay attention to this. You know, I think one of the other things I just want to touch on just a little bit, you know, I think that there's often this perception that whenever our population is aging, that what, who that really impacts are just kind of the older folks within our communities, right? That it's just those who are 65 and older. But I think what we've really seen from a lot of our work is that there are just all of these community and ripple effects that they have as a result of our, of our again, our changing population. You know, so if we take a look, you know, at our, um, you know, our labor, our labor force, we know that older adults are the fastest growing segment of our labor force. You know, we know that if we take a look at some of the fastest growing jobs in our economy, it's our direct care workers. So our home health aides, our personal care aides, you know, our certified nursing assistants, they're amongst the fastest growing, you know, portions you know, of, you know, our, our jobs that folks are, are looking for. You know, if we take a look at those, you know, the family structures that we often, you know, think about and the supports that folks need within their families, you know, we're oftentimes not taking into account family caregivers. And so we know that about 20% of Coloradans, uh, Colorado adults are taking care of, you know, an older loved one. Um, and we know that if we take a look at the, you know, the, the implications for that, there are a lot of pieces around your financial health, your physical health, your emotional health that kind of come along with that. So we pay attention to this because we're thinking again about these systems, we're thinking about these structures, and we're thinking about this community-wide impact that comes about with the changing population. And so then that really gets to why we created this report. So I think as Scott had mentioned before, you know, this you know, our changing population um, and our aging population isn't a, a tremendous shocker, I think, to many people who have been paying attention to our demographics for any amounts of time. Um, you know, but as we have been engaged in this work, and as Scott had, a, had mentioned before, we've been paying attention to this for quite some time. Um, and then I will also just say, as again, Scott had mentioned, in partnership with so many amazing organizations throughout our state who are paying attention to this, you know, one of the things that we really saw was that there is a gap in kind of that available quantifiable information to then say, so where are we? You know, we've been paying attention to this issue for some time, you know, and we know that we're going to need to continue to pay attention to this for decades into the future. What, what is kind of the baseline? Like, what, what are kind of the, the challenges that we're seeing? How do we know if we are making progress? Um, how can we evaluate this in the future? And that's what we really set out to do with this report. Again, to come up with some baseline information, baseline statistics on where we are with regard to aging in our state. So that then gets to how we built this report. So, you know, whenever we took a look at this and whenever we built this report, 
Um, I'm going to talk about in this slide some of the pieces around kind of how the report is structured. Uh, but the first thing I want to talk about is kind of the, the inputs into the report. So, you know, you'll find the report, most of this is very much online. Um, and so you can take a look at, at all of that over there. But as we think about kind of the, the things that, again, went into this report and all of the metrics that I'll be talking about, we really initially thought about it kind of in two different buckets. So we, again, wanted to have this be a very community-informed report. Uh, we also wanted to build upon the great work that's been done just across the board in Colorado because there are so many great folks who are doing this work. So just breaking that down just a little bit. So again, as Scott had mentioned, uh, we did want to take a very community-informed piece to this and approach to this. So we created an advisory group, um, and we were so incredibly fortunate to, to work with several amazing organizations, which Scott had mentioned um, in, in this work. Uh, so again, the Cross Colorado Disability Coalition, uh, One Colorado, thanks, Mark. Um, also, the Center for African American Health, the Colorado Latino Leadership Advocacy and Research Organization, CLARO, Tri-County Health, which is down in the southwest corner of the state, um, and then as well as the Center for African American Health. And, you know, whenever we created this advisory group, you know, we intentionally, um, you know, created this process where we could get feedback from folks throughout the entire year in which we were creating the report. You know, so we would come up with something, we would ask for feedback, have iterative conversations about what was, you know, being discussed, the metrics to include just to kind of across the board. You know, there were multiple individual conversations, group conversations, um, et cetera. You know, and, and I will say one of the reasons why we intentionally kind of took this approach um, and why we created the advisory council was because we know that aging does not look the same for every Coloradan. So based upon your gender, um, you know, where you live, your race, your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, just across the board, all of these different factors, we wanted to make sure we weren't just saying, okay, so this is what aging looks like for everyone. So again, that was an important part of this. The other thing I'll briefly just mention as well, you know, we, we also, again, wanted to build upon the work that's already been done elsewhere. Uh, so we, you know, we, we looked at, you know, and built upon the work that the state has already done, been done, excuse me, been doing, uh, the Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging in Colorado, um, also looking at some of the national work that's been done in AARP, the SCAN Foundation, the Economic Policy Institute. Um, I will also say, you know, we've done also work in this field for quite some time. Uh, we more recently uh, put out a policy agenda before this. And so we had talked with, again, dozens of different folks throughout Colorado, including Dr. Chess, um, within some of this as well. So we built upon a lot of the work that's been done in the space. So those are the inputs that went into this. Um, you know, and thinking then about the structure, again, of the report, again, you'll see on our website, you know, that's where most of this information is housed. Um, you'll see you know, uh, all of the data and different pieces that we have along with this. So breaking down the structure of this, as we were thinking about all of these data points and we were coming up with them, we saw that they kind of fit into four main buckets, right? And again, that, that was based upon uh, the work you know, had, had mentioned just a little bit ago. Um, and so those are the buckets that you see here. So financial security, you know, how are folks' financial health? Uh, their health just in general, so your, your physical health, your mental health, your oral health as well, uh, your ability to live in one's community of choice. So do you have the structures to live in your home and community? We know most older adults want to remain in their homes and communities. So are there direct care workers or their um, uh, friends and family, your built environment as well? And then finally, the quality of life. So do you feel safe in your community? Do you feel valued in your community? We looked at those metrics. So again, we had these four different buckets. Then you know, they, each of these buckets, they really follow uh, this set kind of pattern. If you take a look again at any of this stuff online, you know, what you'll see is you know, we had you know, kind of a top level measurement to say if we want to evaluate how we are doing in Colorado around the health of older Coloradans, what's a good top level metric? 
And so what we, what we, again, we have an initial one for all of these. So for example, in health, that would be, you know, someone's, you know, assessed, you know, their own assessment of their quality of life. You know, but we know that as well, that there are all of these data points that go into, you know, how you assess, you know, your health. And so we look at things like um, your access to insurance, uh, whether or not your, you know, your out-of-pocket costs, uh, transportation challenges, et cetera. And the final thing that we also, you know, noted, so as, as, you know, if you think about it, you know, you have these top level metrics, these contributing metrics, but we also wanted to look at the systems and the levers, you know, the policies that are currently in place so that we can be thinking about how we could kind of change some of these metrics and some of these outcomes in the future. Uh, so we have kind of a systems level piece within all of this. So again, if you take a look at the report, it's you know, broken down across the board within kind of, they're all structured in that same way. So as we were thinking about these different metrics to include in all of this, we were thinking about this from a couple of different standpoints. You know, again, you know, we want this to be something where in the future we can come back and we can say, okay, so how are we doing? You know, this isn't gonna be a one-time report. But in the future, we're going to be looking at these different elements. So we wanted to make sure the metrics we were choosing uh, could be replicable in the future. Uh, they were long term. Um, we also wanted to make sure that they were holistic in nature. So we're looking at a variety of different aspects of aging. We also, again, wanted to make sure where we could, and I'll talk about some of the challenges within this, with this in just a little bit, but we also wanted where we could to disaggregate the data based upon many of the factors that had just mentioned, uh, which again, there were some challenges, but I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, and then again, thinking both about outcomes and then as well around systems. So that's a little bit about the report. Um, I'm next gonna talk about some of the kind of the key findings that we have here. So again, as I had mentioned before, we had these four buckets that had talked about. But what we found just kind of across the board and what I have with these key findings is that, you know, we saw across all of these four buckets kind of some, some trends. And that's what these key findings really speak to. So I'm gonna walk through just uh, quickly around each of these. So the first one that we, that we really talk about here and I think that really stood out was around economic insecurity. Uh, so we did see in this, you know, graph and this chart right here really shows, you know, the percentage of, you know, Colorado families, uh, someone 65 and older, um, and their relationship to the federal poverty threshold. You know, and I think what we see here, and I'll talk about some of the more specific findings from this in a second, you know, but what we see within this is roughly around 20% of older, older Coloradans are living in a household uh, where they, you know, are at about 200% of the federal poverty threshold or below. Right, so there are these immediate indicators, I think, of financial insecurity. But one of the things that we also looked at this, at within this, you know, is around uh, some of these also kind of projected costs for folks. You know, so if we're thinking about, um, you know, for example, we know that most people are going to need some type of care to remain in their home and community. You know. How much is that going to, what's that going to look like if you need to have, you know, a direct care worker, even come for just, you know, 10 hours a week or so, you know, and we found that a lot of people that that's going to take up a significant amount of your income, right? So as we think about this for the future, and one of the things that we'll be looking for is to see how people's income and then their expenses change in the coming years. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of mention that real quick. So talking about you know, the, the second finding that we have. And I think that, that this was something that I think was just stood out just across the board. And again, all of our buckets, unfortunately, it's probably not surprising to many folks, you know, but our second finding really had to do with the disparities for, uh, for older Coloradans of color. And, you know, again, just kind of going back to the previous chart here is that if you look at, you know, the, the percentage of those with the relationship to the federal poverty threshold, for older Coloradans of color, you are much more likely to be living in a household um, that again is closer to the federal poverty line. You know, so breaking that down just a little bit here as well, you know, one of the things that we look at in the report is to then say, okay, so what, and this is in the in kind of the financial security bucket. So what does this look like for families? You know, how are they spending their money? Where are they getting their money from? 
And when we looked at the expense side of this, one of the things that we really saw, which again, of course, is not probably super surprising to anyone, is that your, you know, where, you know, your status as a homeowner or a renter or any of those pieces, you know, that really speaks to how, you know, you know, your expenses, you know, that most Coloradans, older Coloradans are spending, you know, a, a decent chunk of money. Uh, one of the largest expenses is on, on your housing. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we had wanted to take a look at then, and, and of course, knowing that, you know, if you are either renting or if you own your own home, but you are paying a mortgage, your, your expenses are going to be much, much higher than, than, you know, again, if you own your own home outright. So we wanted to take a look to say, okay, so, you know, who owns their home, who's renting, et cetera. And again, probably not surprising, but again, the numbers are fairly stark. But if you take a look at, again, especially who's renting, I mean, we see that, you know, uh, col older Coloradans of color, especially older black Coloradans, much more likely to rent. And again, not super surprising given a lot of the racist policies we've had, you know, you know, for, you know, since our country's founding. So, you know, we'll mention that, you know, the one other thing, just quickly touching on this part as well, again, these findings really kind of stood out just across the board, again, for, um, you know, BIPOC older Coloradans. But, you know, also when we take a look at, you know, health outcomes, self-reported health outcomes, um, again, older Coloradans of color are more likely to say that they have a lower, you know, self-reported health outcomes. And again, we, you know, we saw this, you know, in some of that underlying data as well, you know, while most older Coloradans do have access to health insurance, you know, for Medicare, um, you know, we do find that they are much more likely to say that they have trouble affording co-pays or they have trouble with transportation to get to doctor's appointments. So there are a lot of those underlying factors as well. Um, you know, again, I won't cover it here, but then, you know, as well, when we take a look at just general quality of life kind of statistics, you know, again, older Coloradans of color are more likely to report a lower just in general quality of life. So moving on to the third finding that we have here. Um, so we did notice again that there were kind of geographic disparities. You know, I think as far as where people could access services or where they felt like they could access services and the services we're talking about here um, are things like hospice, palliative care, home health services, um, assisted living facilities, et cetera. Uh, the, the colored in squares, you know, that you see up here are where they either have you know, either none of those services or where they have very few of those services. Um, you know, and I will say one of the things that I think was really helpful, again, especially around intentionally um, working with different communities from rural areas was that they, again, really did point us to some additional uh, services, I think, that we may not have looked at from before. So again, our partners really kind of said, you know, one of the things that you should pay attention to was the availability of hospice and palliative care. And so when we looked at that, you know, we found that, again, of course, there are lots of communities that don't have those services, and that's a major gap in those areas. So, you know, again, that's one of the things that we have here. You know, I will say, you know, when we look at, there are definitely different outcomes within geographic areas. I think one of the things, um, it, they weren't as stark, I think, when we looked at those outcomes for different communities and rural areas except for, I will say, the San Luis Valley, that if we take a look at, again, poverty, um, you know, access to services, a whole lot of other things, the San Luis Valley, I think, really, you know, stood out um, in a lot of that. So the, the fourth finding that I'll talk about here, and this I had alluded to earlier, that we had that across the board, you know, there were significant data gaps in everything. Um, and this ranged from, you know, we just didn't have any information. And so Shannon, as well as Marv, um, you know, from One Colorado and CCDC, you know, you know, in, in, you know, talking about all of this, we found that we just didn't have information, you know, around folks with disabilities, around, you know, those within the LGBTQ community, you know, and again, just kind of across the board that we have some, some great information, again, from folks like One Colorado who do a lot of their own work, but a lot of this does isn't prevalent. We're not capturing this information. You know, the other thing that, again, was really mentioned by a lot of our partners was that, you know, even when we do have some information, it's not disaggregated. 
Uh, so some of that, especially within the rural communities, it's wonderful if you have a provider in a, kind of a large rural area, but let's say you have a big county and then it's just in one area, you know, what about the other folks who are in, you know, the area that's not being served? You know, similarly with, again, BIPOC older Coloradans, oftentimes there was just information to say Coloradans of color, uh, but not more disaggregated. Or, you know, again, I think some of our partners really pointed out that, you know, there were times whenever, um, you know, you might have information about the Hispanic community writ large, but there are lots of differentiations between communities, you know, even within the Hispanic uh, community itself. So, you know, I say all of this again, that there are lots of data gaps. Um, one of the things that I hope, um, one of the things that I think is important from this is that, you know, it, I think that, you know, the lack of data itself is then a problem if we know that communities, you know, are, you know, have different needs, have different um, supports that are valuable to them, uh, which we do know. And, and again, it's, it's difficult to track things when we lack some of this data. You know, the final finding that I'll talk about here, you know, is that, you know, we have been making a lot of progress in Colorado. I mean, we have done a lot of really amazing things over the past several years. I talk about some of them on the slide and again in the report, but you know, whether it's paid family and medical leave, paid sick leave, increasing wages for home health workers, it's not up here, but uh, would be very remiss if I didn't talk about, as Scott had mentioned, the, uh, the Secure Savings Act uh, that was passed last year to help people save for retirement. So as we think about this moving forward and we think about what we need to do, it's tracking this. It's saying, how are these programs working? Are they actually solving our problems? Also, how can we better tailor them to make sure that they're actually meeting the needs of our different and diverse communities? So the final thing that I'll, I'll just touch on very quickly here, I think that then the next question of, of this is then kind of what is next? Uh, so there are a couple of reports you know, that we're working on. Again, we're going to be continuing to um, update a lot of this in the future. Again, this isn't a one-time thing. We're also working again with partners like Shannon and like Marv to you know, continue to think about some of these data gaps and challenges, as well as thinking about this from the financial aspect and doing financial analyses. But the one important part that I think is just really important in all of this is that, you know, as Scott had mentioned from before, it's really lovely to have all this data, but then making sure that this is used. Uh, so I think one of the challenges that we often see within the aging space is that this information in the aging sector is also just, it's kind of considered this siloed little area. It's like, oh, this is just something that impacts the aging community. You know, but as we think about how to integrate this data and integrate this information into the work that's being done by policymakers writ large. So I think it's working with policymakers and working with members of the community to say, you know, as we are updating our workforce policies, as we're updating our family, you know, supports, how do we make sure that we're thinking about older adults, we're thinking about caregivers, we're thinking about all of these other folks. So that's some of the work that, again, we'll be doing, you know, continuing into the future. So that is just a little bit on some of the work that we've been doing, I think, with the report. Um, and again, you know, would love to, um, you know, continue the conversation with all of you. I'll hand it over to Shannon again to talk a little bit about some of her experiences. Good morning. Hopefully I'm not too loud. We turned it down a bit. <laughs> I'm a little louder than Andrea, <laughs> much louder, I should say. So welcome. And my name is Shannon Seacrest, and I am the Deputy Executive Director of the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. We are actually a 30-year organization. Um, we are run by uh, individuals. 95% uh, of our staff have um, some kind of disability, whether that is CP, MS, lupus, brain injury, narcolepsy, you name it, we've got it. <laughs> Um, and so that is one of the things that we talk about is that we live what we speak. Um, also, 65% of our staff are BIPOC. Um, and so again, we are, we are um, part of that intersectionality. Uh, our organization focuses um, primarily on health policy. We work in the Medicaid field, primarily um, some with Medicare for, and some who are duly eligible. Uh, we also uh, work on transportation, we work on employment, um, 
lots of stuff. You can obviously check us out. Sorry, my phone went off. I, I also have, um, I will share with you, I have an acquired brain injury. Um, and so I brought my phone just as a, as a reminder for me of what, what I'd like to say. Um, so again, live, live what we speak. Um, so again, we, we are an advocacy organization. We are the only statewide organization uh, that works across disabilities. There are many, many organizations out there that focus on you know, Down syndrome or intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, you name it. We, there are certainly plenty of standalone organizations out there. We, however, are the only one that do across disability. We also are the only organization that primarily focuses on um, the lifespan from birth to death, right? Um, again, many organizations like Family Voices, Does Children, those kind of things, we actually are across the lifespan. And when we talk about disability, we literally mean anything that is disabling. So if you have ADHD, if you have, again, lupus, if you have a chronic health condition, anything that you believe um, is disabling within your life, come join us. That's, that's what we are about. And so what we do is, um, again, we work mostly in the, in the policy and advocacy field trying to ensure that those policies, um, whether it's regulations, laws, uh, whatever, are relevant to us because we believe that things that are good for our community are most likely good for everyone else. And I'll give you a, an example of what we uh, have used is curb cuts, right? Um, curb cuts used to not exist. And it was one of the things that people with disabilities insisted on curb cuts because if you utilize a wheelchair, uh, you can't get up the curb, right? But guess what? Who else does curb cuts help? They help the UPS guy. They help the elderly. They help the mom with the buggy. They help the kid maybe on a scooter or bike. Um, there are lots of folks that curb cuts um, help. And so that is the way we come into this community is to say that what's good for us is most likely going to be good for everyone. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Working with Andrea and the other groups um, has been phenomenal. And the way we came into this is, again, since we are birth to death, um, we also recognize that um, I've said many times the only good thing or one of the good things about disability is it doesn't discriminate, right? You can uh, be born with a disability, you can have an injury and have an acquired, or you can actually even age into disability, which often happens losing hearing sight. Um, having to utilize a, a wheelchair or DME, those kind of things. Um, and so it also doesn't discriminate as far as size, shape, color, gender, orientation, uh, anything. It, there's no discrimination. And so that is how we come into disability is just knowing that for us, um, it also doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, right? Injury is injury or disability is disability. So for us, there is such a huge, huge intersectionality in the work that we do with everything that, that everyone else does. And so thinking about the coming into aging, I will also say one of the reasons why there isn't a lot of data around disability and aging, we didn't get the opportunity to age, right? Because of medical advances, because of deinstitutionalization, those kind of things, we are now having the luxury of aging. And that didn't actually occur. And so we've discussed this several times about that's why there isn't a lot of data because we just didn't exist. We didn't get to happen. And so that's part of what we are pushing for is to be able to say, okay, as our community now is deinstitutionalized, as we don't, we don't put 20 year olds in nursing homes anymore. We, we have home and community-based services, right? And that's what we have been pushing for for decades. Um, we also, uh, thinking about some of the things that Andrea outlined in the report, um, think about the economics, right? So we know that economically, uh, if you had a disability, typically you weren't working, um, you weren't afforded the luxury of being hired. It's not that you didn't want to work, it's that you weren't offered employment because you were seen as less than. Uh, so we had the economic insecurities. Um, we also have systems set up in our in our country, such as Medicaid, that okay, you can have your, theoretically your medical needs met, but you have a $2,000 asset limit. And so you can't actually save for anything. You can't prepare for anything. 
and you can't you can't uh, have any assets to be able to say that for that rainy day. What does that also mean? Okay, so you can have a home, which we know. I'll point to this like the presentation still there. Um, we know that uh, housing is part of the security of aging, right? If you you can have a house if you're on Medicaid, but if you're only allowed to have a two thousand dollars savings then that $2,000 isn't gonna replace a roof. It's not likely gonna replace a hot water heater. It's not going to replace a lot of those things. So home ownership has never been, or very like, unlikely been an option for many, many people in the disability community. So when you start thinking about the list of things that would, as we age, so our community has already been at a disadvantage going into aging. So we already have the disability, and trying to move into that aging arena. And so you think if we don't have the money, we don't have the homes, we don't even necessarily have the healthcare, we, I will say, are very fortunate in Colorado in that we do have Medicaid expansion, um, which does allow for adults, working adults, to be able to buy into Medicaid. And I won't bore you with all the policy stuff. Uh, it's what I geek out on. Um, but what it does allow is it does allow for folks like me, if I'm a working adult with a disability, um, I would be able to buy into Medicaid and it would take off the asset limit. So I could actually save some money. I could actually own a home. I could have some things that would better prepare me for that aging um, with the disability. But again, that's predicated on if I've grown up, are our schools set up for kids with disabilities? Are we teaching employment? For kids with disabilities. It still goes back to that economic insecurity. And again, I'll just say that this is not, this is not a, a color issue for us. I mean, this is disability is across uh, every sector. And so for us, we feel like we already come into this discussion at an economic disadvantage um, as not being homeowners. Um, again, we have fought for decades about getting home and community-based services. There was actually just um, with federal funding, there was supposed to be 400 million uh, for home and community-based services um, that literally got cut in half. Uh, and, and I think it's because people see it as, as an other, um, like it's all those other disability type folks. And we have not embraced um, or seen that home and community-based means that you can have a choice to age in, in your home. You can decide where, if you, want, if you want to live in a nursing home, that's great. If you want to live with your Aunt Betty, you can. Um, I think those, those, that's what it does for us. It is about having the choice to decide the how and the where you age in your own space. And if that's here, that's fine. If it's there, that's great. Um, I will also say, I actually came into this community and you'll have to watch my time, I'm very verbose. Um, I did actually come into this community because uh, I have a son. I have a son who is 18, um, so now just an adult. He actually is deaf. Um, he actually also has an intellectual and developmental disability uh, and he has extreme behavioral mental health uh, issues. And so thinking also about the workforce, um, I am a licensed CNA. I have been for 11 years. I am his care provider. And so again, thinking about as I age, why be able to care for him? I'm also a sandwich generation. My mother is 80, I'm trying to help her, keep her in her community, keep her safe. Um, and so this is where we talk about that two generation, three generation, four generation. This is not about my mom anymore, right? This is not about that aging elderly population. It's how do I take care of her? How do I age? I'm not young anymore. How do I age into, into this community knowing that I have, I have a labeled diagnosis, I have a disability. My son has a disability. So how do we move from generation to generation knowing that each one of us is going to have unique needs and how do we address that and keep us in our communities? What happens when I'm too old to care for him? Are our healthcare systems, are our Medicaid systems, are our communities prepared to not stick him in an institution, right? That's what we're trying to get away from. And, and don't get me wrong, I believe in pharmaceuticals. I believe in uh, you know, the necessity of nursing homes. I, 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 I'm not poo-pooing anything. I'm just saying that 
We have also learned that it's about a third of the cost for me to take care of my son at home than to stick him in an institution. I mean, that's just the reality. It is a cost saving. Does it, is it cheap? No, but it's, it's a third of the cost to put him in an institution. And so that's how we come into this is just that intersectionality. Our system is gonna be able to take, you know, somebody with extreme complex healthcare needs and have them age into this process and be able to keep them in the community, keep them safe. Um, and again, we're just one example. And so that's why I love doing this work with Andrea and the Bell and all of our partners, um, because again, for us, there is that intersectionality. Oops.